I think so. We should probably have Molly, right? Yeah. Susan, do you need to sign by Thank you. I'm catching up. Should we wait for Molly or just start? Mike's around. Okay, should we wait for Molly or should we start? Okay. So uh, I now call to order the regular meeting of the Lake Orion Downtown Development Authority uh, Board of Directors. It is now 631, Tuesday, December 14th, 2021. <coughs> Uh, Susan, may I please have a roll call and determination of core? Uh, Chairperson Burgess requested to be excused. Vice Chairperson Shell? Here. Secretary Caruso? Here. Member Barnett? Member Cole? Here. Uh, Member Horbeth was excused. Can Member Laurent? Here. Member Sheridan? Here. Member Van Portfleet? Here. Uh, we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, first item is the approval of minutes for the DDA board regular meeting minutes, November 9th, 2021. Move to approve the DDA board minutes from November 9th, 2021. Support. Uh, roll call, please. Okay. Um, Cole? Yes. Shell? Yes. Sheridan? Yes. Lorand? Yes. Van Portfleet? Yes. Caruso? Yes. <clears throat> Motion carries 5 0. Uh, 5 4. I'm sorry. 5 0. 5 here, 6 uh, 4 absent. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Couldn't get it right. <laughs> Too many meetings. All right. And then the next item on the agenda is a Six. presentation. Uh, we just have one presentation tonight, and just a reminder, there are no decisions made immediately following a presentation. So please welcome Jeff Aronoff, uh, Miller Canfield, for a parliamentary procedure refresher. That should last about 20 minutes, and there will be time for questions. Great, thank you very much. Good evening. Um, I was asked to provide a refresher on parliamentary procedures. So uh, it's a brief, uh, discussion or brief presentation. Um, are you able to, s you don't have screens in front have of you. Down, oh, you, yes. you have a screen down here? Okay, good. Perfect. Um, so I put together just a, a few brief slides um, and really don't wanna talk too long and would really, I think, uh, believe that you would get more benefit out of just asking questions uh, if you have them. Um, but what I will do is just walk through what I believe to be some things worth keeping in mind. Uh, so let's just get right into it. Uh, really going to organize the discussion uh, along three chapters, if you will, core concepts, which sounds broad and maybe philosophical, but is very important, and we'll get to that. Uh, when I get to that, I'll tell you why. And then a few key rules, um, not drilling down in too much depth, and then, as we said, leaving time for questions and answers. So starting with core concepts, um, and I'm not gonna turn this into some sort of lecture type class kind of environment, um, but uh, I think you'll see why some of this stuff is relevant. So you see I, I, this definition of parliamentary procedure is m my kind of interpretation of it. It's not in a book or, or a dictionary somewhere, though you, you would see definitions, I'm sure, if you looked for them. But I refer to it as the, the umbrella term referring to the rules that provide structure and uniformity to meetings at which a governing body conducts business. A governing body, 
doesn't necessarily need to be a governmental entity, municipal entity, a village council, a DDA board, county commission, state legislature, um, nonprofit boards, for-profit boards, uh, any entity that makes decisions on, be any body that makes decisions on behalf of a, uh, of a broader entity um, has rules of procedure and we refer to those as parliamentary procedure often. Um, one thing that uh, is important to note, uh, very often, you, know, you see this more, let's say, with city and village councils that have like their city attorney sitting up at the, um, up at the you know, uh, bench with the governing body. If there's an issue over, a, over a, a, the form of a motion or a procedural question, they'll often ask the attorney. Um, and it's important to remember that parliamentary procedure is not law. If you adopt your budget without posting a notice of the budget hearing, you've done it wrong. If you um, approve a resolution without properly sequencing the motion and discussion, you haven't done it wrong. You haven't broken the law. You have not taken some step that's out of uh, sync with your legal requirements. Um, it, as, you see, as you see on the slide, though, I, I say it does intersect with the law, and you'll find out why. So stick a pin in that, in that uh, statement. So why is parliamentary procedure used? We often say it is for the benefit of the body. As I say, it's not to satisfy a statute. There's nothing in the Open Meetings Act, for example, that requires you to adopt parliamentary procedures. Nothing in the DDA Act or, or now the, the, the recodified uh, Tax Income and Finance Act that requires you to par use parliamentary procedure. It is a, a, the most sort of common approach to uh, uh, conducting meetings, but um, it's really for your benefit for those sort of bullet points that I list on that, on that slide. Effective meetings, um, and, and I would say that, and you can read these, but the last two for me would be where they would intersect with the law, where parliamentary procedure or rules of order would intersect with the law. Uh, ensuring board members have clarity regarding the decisions that they're being asked to vote on and establishing a clear record of business. So under the law, you do have to adopt resolutions for things, or you know, if you're, at, depending on the kind of, of, of governing body you are, you may enact ordinances. You do take action that has legal relevance. The point of parliamentary procedure is to make sure the action that you took was clear to everybody, both uh, on the governing body, in this case the board, and to anyone that would be reviewing the decisions of the governing body. So that's where the two intersect. <laughs> Parliamentary procedure itself is not law, but because it, it's designed to give clarity to your actions, it can often be helpful when determining whether you took some course of action that may have some legal significance. So with that in mind, we'll talk about a few key rules. Okay, so uh, Robert's Rules of Order, you've probably heard of Robert's Rules of Order. Got the the book here, and this is a reminder of how much detail there is, and this is not very large font either. Um, it's a reminder of how many details there are to uh, Robert's rules being the by far the most common um, set of rules for, for uh, parliamentary type um, meetings. And in your bylaws, you do reference Robert's rules of order. Um, but be aware that Robert's rules of order are truly parliamentary in the sense that they are designed for a large body. Um, and a lot of that is, is designed to organize a discussion that is happening among a very large number of people where time and uh, ongoing debate can, without those parameters, can you know, go on indefinitely really. And you can have all sorts, you know, many, many kind of combinations of of, of directions that a, that a large deliberative body goes off into where you lose, where you can sort of devolve into chaos quickly. Robert's Rules itself contains provisions for smaller bodies. Uh, and I think the DDA board would qualify uh, as that. Uh, in Robert's Rules, it refers to that as like less than a dozen members. 
But the, the uh, informal rules maybe swing back too far back the other way. For example, there are provisions that say you don't even need to have a formal motion uh, for certain types of items or a motion doesn't need to be seconded, or you don't need to clearly state the motion if it's obvious. So for a lot of deliberative bodies, that would be too informal. And so I think really most organizations, most governmental entities, DDA boards, village councils, city councils, really operate somewhere in, in the middle of these super informal rules and this, you know, 10, you know, 50,000 word kind of um, set of, of, of prescriptions. Um, so you gotta strike that balance. And, um, and I think in practice that's what most uh, entities do. And even just kind of observing your opening kind of uh, proceedings, I think that's what you do. And I think, it, I think it works for the most part. So to the extent that you wanna drill down a little bit on some of the most specific rules, um, we could go, we could get into specific rules all night. Uh, don't want to do that um, because I think that uh, if, I'm, if I'd have to pick one sort of, let's call it chapter of Robert's rules that would be most important to a body like this, it's, it's the form of motion, right? Most of what you do uh, to the extent that there's formal action taken comes in the, in the form of a motion. There may be a motion related to a resolution, right? You'll oftentimes you'll have formal resolutions, but those are, adopted by motion and second in voting. So uh, a motion, as you can see on the slide up there, has six basic features. A chair recognizes a member or a member speaks up um, a, in, in, and articulates the motion, makes the motion, speaks the motion. Second member seconds that motion. Then the chair restates the motion for clarity purposes. Uh, and then that opens up debate or discussion. And then once there is kind of a, a, um, a break in the action, the chair exercises discretion to sort of observe the, maybe the silence and then fill in and call for uh, a vote and the vote would take place, chair would announce the result. In practice, the, the, um, the change in sequencing that I see most often is that someone will observe the agenda item and you'll start in with debate before anyone introduces a motion. But in fact, the sort of perfectly proper way to do it is that the very first thing that happens when you uh, are dealing with an item in business is you get the motion on the floor and that opens up the door for debate. But again, the fact that most bodies do it the other way, where they're talking for a half hour on something or 10 minutes on something before someone actually introduces a formal motion, as long as everyone is clear about what they ultimately decided on, that, in my experience, does not diminish the quality of the proceedings, and it certainly doesn't diminish the effectiveness of the final decision. Yeah. So that thing. So is it is it in the right of the the, the, the president or the, or, the, or the chairperson to stop the debate and say let's do the motion first? Is 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 it is it the proper order for the chairperson to stop the debate and then? Re reinstate the motion and then go proper procedures? But I, I would say would stop that if I, out of I would say that you should decide on a cadence that you use, right? So I, let's say in the case of a, of a board that, that always does uh, have its discussion after the opening of the motion. If that is the habit of the board, then I would say, wait, I would say that that's the time where a chair could say, our practice here gotcha. is to introduce the motion first and then have debate. So on the, I think, and I think that's an answer to, to most questions. Like, right? when is it the proper to kind of interrupt discussion to correct a procedural, what we, the board, would view as a procedural irregularity? The answer to that is almost always when it's something you don't normally do, when it's not your normal course of dealing. If you want to start to develop the habit of, of you know, I, I, I haven't been to one of your meetings before. Have you, do you typically, <laughs> Start discussing things before anyone introduces a motion. No, we, we do typically this. do do the motion in, in discussion. Typically, uh, okay. Well, then that's that's the proper format. And because you do do it that way, I would say it's appropriate to, um, you know, for a chair to step in and just sort of, you know, kind of correct the path a little <clears> bit. <throat> yeah. But if it was the other way around, I would say don't bother like trying to kind of move, a, you know, the the friction that comes from that sort of thing. One question, if I might. Sure. I have no questions. Yeah, no, 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 that we can ask absolutely. After discussion, 
Should the chair restate the motion? Because there could have been a long lapse and it may not be clear to the members of what they're voting on. Yeah, I think that's a really good, I think that's a really good practice. Uh, the, the rules would tell you that the chair states the, the motion, restates the motion after the second, right? The uh, introduction, second, chair restates it so everyone knows what they're debating. But as a matter of practice, um, again, not required, but if there's, particularly if there's long discussion, um, and we'll get into like things like amendments, and, and sometimes people do lose track of what they're actually voting on. That's probably your biggest risk as any kind of deliberative body, where you, a discussion may have taken you, you know, you may have a, a motion that's framed a certain way. And maybe it's not, it's not linked to a written resolution. It's easier when there's a written resolution, because it almost doesn't matter what the, what the, the uh, let's call it the text or the narrative of the motion is, because it always anchors to a resolution. But when you don't have a written resolution, you, you, the discussion may start to um, take on a life of its own, and then it would be uh, the proper use of a chair's discretion to come back and say, before we vote, I want to be clear on the motion that is before the body, and you're just restating what the uh, introducer of the motion or the initial mover and the second have, um, have uh, put before the board. So there's a few types of motions, or many types of motions. These are the kind of six that I, I think of as the most uh, common. Um, and, and really, in my experience, it, with city councils, village councils, DDA boards, it's almost always just like a single, you're, you're, you're moving on a single piece of business. But you have the main motion, although very often uh, you will have a secondary motion. This actually does, can trip, uh, uh, governing bodies up from time to time. Um, and I have this little, like, put these little icons up there, and that's, I think of this uh, as kind of a ladder going down a, a hole or a manhole. Like, you go down, you need to get yourself back up, right? So if, for example, you have a motion, this is all, again, verbal motions, but where the words matter, let's say, or even where it's associated with a written uh, resolution that maybe you don't like the words that are in the resolution. A motion will be on the floor and then someone will, in an intervening kind of statement, seek to amend the motion. Okay, so now you're going down the ladder. Now you've sort of taken another step. Well, now I've introduced another motion. The, um, the amending motion is its own motion. So let's say, for example, you introduce uh, uh, a motion to repaint the, um, the village council chambers um, blue. And so you start talking about it and then everyone says, we definitely need to repaint, we need to repaint it blue. And so you, someone's introduced the motion, I hereby move to repaint the village uh, council chambers blue. Do I have a second? Second. So now you're talking about repainting. Everyone agrees they need to repaint. You know, the walls are chipped. And then someone says, oh yeah, actually, I agree we should repaint it, but I think it should be red. We're going to still repaint the wall, so, but I, I move that we amend our motion from repainting blue to repainting red, okay? Now there's a new vote on just the, the form of the motion itself. You're now correcting the motion. You have to vote on the amendment itself before you then vote on the substance. So everyone might say, All right, we move to uh, amend the motion to red. Second, everyone approves. Now the, the amendment has been approved, but then you can still, still vote on or you know, approve or, or deny the actual motion. We, we all agree we're voting on red, but now we say we don't want it red, right? You're, you're climbing back up and getting back to the initial motion. So you've had a secondary approval of just the change itself. You approve that, then you bring that back up to the surface and you vote on the actual item of business. Have I lost everyone there, or was that analogy so clear? So if I, don't want, if, if I don't agree with the motion, you still have to, would I, why would you even like second the motion that you don't want? Maybe no one would. Maybe no one, you know, amendments oftentimes, you know, you might say, all right, uh, do I have a, a, you know, do I have a, a motion, there's a, a motion to amend the resolution from blue to red, and everyone knows, like, uh, we know no one's gonna approve red, everyone loves blue, um, so, there's just silence. And that motion just does not, that, that amending motion just doesn't come to life. 
So you can have a second to the motion, then the vote would just yeah, if you didn't second the motion, you haven't gone down the rungs of the ladder to have to climb back out, right? Uh, so a motion that's not second and just, it just evaporates. Gotcha. Any motion, even if maybe at the initial outset, we'll stick with this metaphor here or, or hypothetical for a second, maybe no one wanted to paint the, the chambers anyway, so the whole thing could die. Any motion can die with silence, right, without being seconded. But you're saying that if it's supported, the second motion, then it takes first place of order of business. Right, you have to, you have to uh, 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 attend to that rung on the ladder before you climb back out and get to the initial motion. Your, your, your amending motion, your secondary motion comes first. You have to sort of work your way backwards to get back to that initial motion. That's exactly right. If it's seconded, now the motion is live and you gotta vote. You have to, I mean, maybe you discuss it, but then you have to vote before you can you have to vote on the amendment itself before you can vote on the, on the business item. Most frequently I see where that's not the order. It's there's a motion on the floor that has to be attended to first before another motion can be heard. That's what I see happen most often. And that's what I've heard of direction. In the case of an amendment? We had that just the other night in the Planning Commission where there was an amendment to the motion, but it was, it had to be addressed first, the first motion, before the second one could be taken on. It's confusing. Just want to remind everybody to speak into the microphone so that um, the recording can be heard. Thank you. In that case, was that maybe something additional or was that a change to, I'm talking about something that affects the initial motion, not like an additional item that you would be kind of adding. That might, I don't know what the example is there, but the idea here with a secondary motion, it's something that fundamentally changes the initial motion. Right, that's sort of the red to blue thing. Like, you know, if, if, if the idea was, if it was like, well, you know, we'll stick with this, maybe strange hypothetical, but it might work. Um, if the idea was, well, you know, red to blue or blue to red, and then someone else says, well, wait a minute, if we're gonna, if we're gonna paint the walls, we need to also refinish the floors. Then we say that's a different item of business, right? That, the, those two might be related. We would say, no, we need to resolve the paint the walls issue before we start talking about, you know, uh, uh, refinishing the floors. Refinishing the floors doesn't change the decision about what color you want to change the walls. So I don't know if, if, the, if the scenario you're talking about, that, that second piece fundamentally changed the initial item of business, but that is the very kind of scenario where sometimes governing bodies are confused about what they're, what they're approving. I mean, if you think about the logic to it, right, why would you approve the initial motion only to then introduce a second motion that would inherently contradict the first motion, because now you got two, you have two uh, approvals that could uh, contradict each other. You can't decide to paint the walls both blue and red, right? You have to decide one. That second motion fundamentally changes the first motion. But I can see scenarios where a second item might feel related to it, and I could see in that case the chair would say, no, we need to resolve this business first before we get to that, uh, this other piece of business. But if it was a motion that fundamentally changed the initial motion, I would tell you that the rules of procedure, that the, that the rules of order would dictate that that amendment be handled first as a secondary motion before the initial one is addressed. Again, if by the end of it, everyone was crystal clear on what was decided, I would tell you it doesn't exactly matter, right? You, if, you, if, if there's no board members, again, back to this principle of existing for the benefit of the body, if there's no board member who walked out and said, I, I don't know what we decided on because I was so sort of confused in the process, that would be a problem if someone re reacted that way. But if, if you kind of get through the sausage making of, a, of maybe a, 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 an inefficient or not perfectly uh, linear parliamentary procedure 
a chapter in a, in a meeting, but by the end of it, everyone's on the same page. As if I'm sitting there as the lawyer to the body, I wouldn't say, wait, 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 back up, guys. Let's do all of this over again because we didn't follow parliamentary procedure, so long as it was clear that everyone understood the ultimate decision. Jeff, uh, in your scenario, if the First Amendment motion to read passes, could they withdraw the blue motion because it's there already voted? Well, again, that amendment, the blue, mo the, the blue uh, uh, motion is amended. It becomes the red motion. Right? Your initial thing, the amendment changes the motion. That's sort of the whole idea there. Yeah, you've, you've, you've now, remember, we're talking about an amendment to the motion, to the initial motion. I mean, you can sort of feel yourself sort of talking in, a, in these long strings here, but, but you see the logic here, right? The idea is you now don't, you don't need to do anything new with the, with the blue motion because it becomes, you've amended it, it has become the, the red motion, this, the, the amended motion. And now you've got to go back up and vote on it, but it's now, it's, it is the amended motion. Does that make sense? You have to vote on the. You, vote you have to vote on it as a business item, right? You've you've approved the amendment to the motion. Right. And now you have to vote. And now you have to vote on whether you want it, want to pass it or not. So, okay. Right. So. Okay. So yeah. then, so no, so let's say, let's say the, the motion for red fails. Mm -hmm. Do you go not not? We're back up to blue. We, we back, still have no, to address. No, we have to go back and vote on blue again. Right. We okay. still. Okay. It's it's like think of it again. Sort of thinking of it as on this ladder down the manhole uh, analogy. It's still one ladder, one man, one vertical you know, plane here mm -hmm. where we have to get, by the end of it, we have to have dug ourselves out there. Maybe I have seen like amendments layered on top of amendments layered on top of amendments because there may be controversy over that initial, these things that are more controversial than blue walls or red walls, right? And so you have <coughs> uh, 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 board members or council members jousting with each other and that becomes the, re the very reason why you need to address the amendments to what you're even considering before you make the final uh, business decision or the final substantive policy decision. So you would have two votes for running. Yeah, you'd have the vote uh, to amend it, to amend the resolution itself and then the vote on the resolution or the, the motion itself. Yeah. So, if you're involved with any kind of a motion, especially when it gets complicated like that, and you're now you, somebody has to make an, a motion for that second piece of the puzzle, is it okay to say so moved instead of repeating all this stuff? Is it okay to say so moved? What? In other words, we're talking. We're talking. So I'm, talking. I'm going to make the the motion. It's okay to choose. Uh, you know, red over blue or whatever. So, I, is it okay for me to say so moved? Yeah, I mean that is the okay. form in which you would. It, it, yeah, so moved is a, I, I think, an acceptable. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as long as now, now look, if someone else on the board might say, wait a minute, stop. Okay. What's so moved? And yeah. then that's just when the chair chimes in, yeah. and okay. the the chair is always there to just r reset the conversation. There doesn't need to necessarily be any kind of. Um, formal step. The chair's job is to kind of just shift everything back on track if ever there is lack of clarity um, as to what everyone's discussing. Um, I mean, I've seen chairs, you know, kind of interrupt folks, and, and, uh, but they do it in a way that is not meant to um, diminish what, the, what maybe a, a board member is saying, but rather that just to make sure that everyone is talking about the same thing, because that's what these, these talking about the same thing and right. realizes that they're talking about the same thing. Hell, half the t they're not half the time, but many times I've had boards that are talking about the same thing that don't even realize it. They think they've gone in different directions because a, a, a conversation gets so convoluted and then the, you know, the board chair may uh, kind of realign everybody and you have two board members that thought they were talking about something different and actually were talking about the same thing. So. Um, you know, obviously we're kind of venturing down these complicated paths here and, and you know, nine out of ten matters before any board are just going to be pretty straightforward. You're not going to get into these secondary pieces, but they do when they pop up. If you don't have a system you're confident in, that's when you start tripping over yourself as you get into layers of amendments and secondary motions. Um, I, you know, I won't go get into too much. Uh, 
um, other uh, examples. I guess the one other one I will uh, mention briefly, the motion to table. Sometimes people don't know what tabling is. Is that, is that putting it, is it delaying it? Is that moving it to a different part of the agenda? Is that just pausing discussion? The motion to table is effectively a motion to cancel whatever item is on the, uh, in front of the, front of the board. T you know, if something gets put on a table, you can later, you know, someone can later introduce a motion to remove it from the table, but that's no different than just disapproving it and then reintroducing it later. But effectively, oftentimes someone is looking for some other half to the motion of table, to table. All right, we've motioned or maybe we've approved tabling. Well, now what? The answer is nothing. The answer is if you do nothing else, something that's been tabled is just in suspended animation and never has to come back. Right, um, and there are a few different ways you could get it off the table. You just introduce it as a new motion at the next meeting or something like that. Uh, very often people think, well, so if something's been tabled at a previously meeting, is there some special uh, motion to remove it from the table? I have seen boards that have tabled um, uh, business items at a later uh, meeting, go through this sort of um, ritual of kind of pulling it off the table. That's fine, but that's not really required. There's no magic to like removing something from the table. I, I think of, and I think, and in the, in the rules certainly put it this way, and I think it's, it's, it's simplest for governing bodies to think of the, the concept of tabling is just killing a motion. That's really effectively what it is, and that's just a term you see come up, and when, when board members or council members are using it or having others use it, they're, they're a little uncomfortable with it. They feel like it may mean more, uh, maybe weightier than it really is. It requires a second as well, though? A What's that? Table requires a second. Yeah, I mean, a, a, every motion really proceeds under that same cadence, right? Um, um, yeah. Calling the question, other than motion. Um, so when you s calling the question, that's a that is that's a that's terminology that I often think of as like uh, in a, a larger deliberative body that has gone on for debate for a while. That is just another form of ending debate, really. Um, is that a motion I, itself that needs to be voted on? To vote on, are we going to call the question? Because some. But some people feel that if I say it's called question, you got to go to a meeting vote on the item. But my understanding is no, you need to have a vote. Do we want to call the question first? Well, look, any, any for, for smaller bodies, I would, I would characterize it this way. And this is especially helpful if you use the, uh, the uh, sequencing that you use, which is uh, motion and second first. You have a live question that something needs to be done with it, right? Um, Endless debate at the local level doesn't look anything like endless debate in Congress, right? Like, it, look, if, a, if a, a DDA board is debating something for an hour, that feels like a long, or two hours, you know, maybe there have been public, some real, real heavy issue. That is actually, you know, you don't want, it, you don't want to end debate out of impatience, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I would tell you that the concept of calling the question, I would almost, not even employ that much. I would say let that debate happen, even if it feels like it's taking forever, mm -hmm. because that is sort of, that is in line with the way local government works. Um, the idea of, the, of calling the question, I think for smaller uh, deliberative bodies, very often that is the chair sort of chiming in and ending debate, but I would recommend against using that principle at all. I would say let debate continue until people are out of breath and at that point, the chair, no, you know, that's when you sort of jump in and observe the silence, the break in the action. You know, and it's okay for the chair to say, is there no other debate on this? It's okay to have an English conversation that isn't, um, you know, in line with some prescribed script. It's okay to talk like people to each other as you're, uh, as you're uh, deliberating. So um, you don't think at the local level it shouldn't be used like a trump card to get everyone up here to stop talking? We should really let everyone on that still has a chance, especially the members, to have a chance to express their opinions. And I, I the, just in terms of what I've seen effective for, for board action and council action, um, you know, I, I have never been at a municipal meeting 
And I've been to some very, very long ones. Very often it's on the, the matter that's not even mine and I'm after it and it's four hours talking about some zoning change. Um, it, it, it tires everybody out but, uh, and, and it may annoy the decision makers, but I've never seen them come away from that feeling like we really should have just cut off debate. Maybe the, maybe the, the faction that didn't like the item wanted to cut off debate earlier, but that's the very reason why it shouldn't have been cut off. So e even, even what feels like a long and repetitive discussion, um, it, my recommendation based on what I've seen from effective boards is the calling the question practice is um, really more for these massive deliberative, deliberative bodies that could be like debating for days, really. Um, and that's, I, I've never seen that kind of thing. And look, if something is so um, sort of circuitous and endless, there may never be a vote and the thing may just die. People may just be silent. Uh, now, again, if you, if you have um, used this cadence of motion second before debate, you know, you're going to have to do something with it because you have a motion that has to be resolved. That makes sense? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, there's a few uh, points of order here. Um, a point is something that is not uh, voted on. It's not a motion. It's not something that requires uh, uh, action by the body. It is an individual uh, asserting a point or sometimes asking a question. It can come, you know, even if, the, even if there's a motion that's open, it's okay to raise a point, a point of order. You know, someone may have a question about the procedure and need to clarify, and the answer doesn't matter as much as everyone's understanding of the answer. As long as you all are on the same page as to what you're doing procedurally, the substance of what you're doing procedurally doesn't matter as much as agreement about it. A point of information, um, look, these days sometimes information and opinion are, are um, sometimes not so clear. Uh, I, I have uh, I've many times seen a, um, a council member or board member raise a point of information which gives them just the right to just say something. And it doesn't matter too much because it could just be part of debate. But that information turns out to be opinion or something like that. Usually a point of information is something like no, the clerk dropped that uh, envelope off this afternoon. Something that is a fact, not something you know that is that is maybe asserted as a fact, but is really an opinion. Uh, very often, there will be debate that may be uh, based around a, a, a misunderstanding of an incontrovertible fact. Like you know, our clerk didn't didn't drop off the uh, envelope that had the bids. And that's why we need to change our bidding procedures and we're talking about that and someone says, look, point of information, the clerk uh, dropped off the envelope at four, it's timestamp 4.30 this afternoon, you just didn't see it, right? That's something that is, that's a, a proper point of information. On a, no, procedurally, how should the chairperson handle it when someone point of order? Should it be recognized by the chair first before they speak? Yeah, so let's, that, that question is important in general, like there are some boards that speak freely with each other, address each other, others that address just the chair or the mayor or whoever the, the, um, the uh, chair of the body is. Uh, I'll give you an example, the city of Detroit, right, a, a, a big uh, unit of government with a lot of controversial issues. They have this kind of clumsy practice of anyone who's speaking just speaks, but they just say through the, through the chair, like they just kind of start by saying, but they don't actually seek to be recognized by the chair if it's a, like a committee meeting, right, or the, or the chair is, is um, you know, the, the city council chair or something like that. So, you know, I have seen a lot of bodies just kind of introduce everything by saying through the chair, through the mayor, but they don't actually wait to be recognized by the chairperson of that entity. Others truly do. They, they, you know, they, they may have a, a more um, adversarial board or council where uh, members uh, addressing each other becomes a problem. Uh, that works a lot of different ways. Um, uh, if you are in the habit of having a more free-flowing free discussion, um, it can be a little bit um, jarring to all of a sudden turn that into something where all of the, the um, conversation has to flow through the chair. 
Um, what, what's your... Well, no. suppose having people talk, many people talking at one time. Certainly the chair should, should uh, yeah, can, can, you know, exercise that discretion. That's sort of the gavel pounding, um, you know, action where the chair says, wait, one person at a time. And it doesn't take more than that. There doesn't need to be some specific procedural uh, magic words that need to be spoken if everyone's talking over each other. That oftentimes the, the chair will simply say one person at a time. And then, you know, it's adults in the room and they even in some of the most adversarial boards, they at least, you know, they take turns swearing at each other or something Sometimes like that. Sometimes they right? say, this chair recognizes this person, and after that, it'll be this person and then this person, so they know. Right. That's right. And I think that's actually an area where, where sometimes you're not totally uniform. Sometimes the chair will say, well, you can, the chair will exercise discretion and sort of step in and decide we need to be a little bit more disciplined. If we were, if we were talking about the paint on the wall, maybe we could just have a free flowing discussion. But I'm going to, as chair, recognize you know one person at a time and that doesn't need to be tied you know linked to some uh, formal procedural step that's just the chair exercising that discretion to keep uh, to keep debate in an orderly and clear kind of path I think typically our board it goes to the chair typically if someone's going to be addressed they you know I guess the chair would say hey uh, Mr. Graham for, for, for your next you have your hand up or Chris is up next, and Mr. Burnett, I think that's how we do it. So. That, that's a great way to do it. That's a great way to do it. Um, now, now, sometimes that's the case, and you recognize one person at a time, but they're still addressing each other. Like, you know, member A, you're recognized, and they're talking to member B, and then some, some boards really don't even want any of the discussion directed at each other. Mm -hmm. It's all the discussions directed, right? You know, like they refer to the other member in their disparaging remarks, Mis Mr. Chair, you know, the, the, the degenerate and, you know, and, and seat <laughs> F over there says such and such, that kind of thing. But it's certainly easy, better than people calling each other, each other degenerates over each other. So you can see that the implementation and execution of the rules varies a lot with the um, prevailing kind of uh, energy on, on the board. And it changes, and it's okay. And that's sort of why a chair is really important. Um, it, it, you know, I've seen many boards and councils that are the same people, but based on the issue, they, they become different people, and the chair will turn up or turn down the kind of procedural um, clamps on a discussion, mm -hmm. and it doesn't need to be found in some page in Robert's rules, okay? Um, I, I think we, we won't get into more detail, because I, I, although we're, we're, we're integrating the questions into the discussion, which I think is great, but I don't want to take too much of your time. I know you have a long agenda. Um, other issues that uh, are worth thinking about, uh, I was going to talk a little bit about officer roles, but we've talked about the importance of the chair. I mean, I, I really uh, believe that, again, nine out of ten discussions are just pretty simple, straightforward approvals. But when there's a challenge, um, the, the chair just exercising leadership, the chair is a leader, and there's a reason that a chair or a mayor or whoever is the the chair of that body is in that position, that, that gavel, you know, they're trusted to do, do it fairly and evenly and not with their own individual agenda. Uh, there, there are exceptions to that, right? Sometimes chairs are abusive in that role, but um, more often, if, if you take the, 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 the very small number of truly contentious issues, and then within that universe, you find those cases where there's also a abusive chair. It's very, very, very low. Um, so I think those principles of, of, of proper and effective chair leadership uh, are really important. Um, you know, I noticed in your bylaws, you have a really kind of a, a set um, uh, uh, order for the way you design agendas. Robert's Rules talks a little bit about that, but it always defers to your bylaws. You have good bylaws in that regard. I don't have any uh, issue with the way you set up. I, I think you have a really nice setup to your meeting cadence. 
minutes are important. That's, you know, the, the technically the board secretary, any board secretary keeps the minutes, but that can always be delegated to a, a, a designee, a staff, that sort of thing, and that's very common. Um, you know, secretary signs minutes and signs certifies resolutions and that sort of thing. So the secretary is responsible for the accuracy of minutes, responsible for the accuracy of vote records and any documentation, even if the secretary isn't the one physically um, you know, conducting that activity. Um, uh, Roberts Rules talks about bylaws. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reviewing your bylaws just for some general, you know, observations. We'll have a, a separate discussion about that. Um, but you have a pretty good set of bylaws. And Roberts Rules, there are a number of items in an entity's bylaws that are also addressed in Roberts Rules. And to the extent bylaws that work well, contradict with Roberts, contradict Roberts rules, use the bylaws. Don't, you know, Roberts rules are not dogma. They're not something that is, as I said, it's not law. Um, your job is to uh, carry out your powers as clearly as possible, both for the, the, the mutual clarity of the members of the board and for the well-being of the village and, and the DDA district. Um, I'll, I'll do a brief kind of open meetings mention here, right? Like a lot of the um, elements of a meeting that may be parliamentary procedure in, in nature do have some overlap with some real statutory requirements, namely those under the Open Meetings Act. Not so much things like notices and so forth, but um, public comment, you know, you always want to have a, a, a pretty clear uh, public comment period. Some entities have two, some will have one at the beginning. I, I don't remember if you do have two public comments. You do have two, okay. I think that's a really good practice. Um, Counterintuitively, it tends to make the meeting shorter, actually. Uh, I, I don't know why that's happened, but even where, where, when I've been at, at let's say board or council meetings that seem to have items of similar controversy and it's somehow there's kind of like a two uh, public comment uh, periods versus one. One public, public, public comment period sometimes, somehow tends to be much, much longer than two. So two is really good. Um, uh, so that's something I would have recommended had I not seen it. Um, the other one is closed session protocol. Closed sessions, I, I, I trust you do this, and I think I've seen this in your, your minutes. Closed sessions are the subject of a motion and a second and the whole, that whole thing. And under the Open Meetings Act, though, you do need to state the purpose of any closed session. So um, we won't get into the details of business conducted at a closed session, but um, you, know, you need to inform the public at the meeting why you are going into closed session, and then you need to have a, a, a kind of a closing motion to come out of closed session. Um, I have seen entities, and it's always very frustrating for me when I'm, let's say, doing a bond resolution for a city that has a city attorney, maybe, and they're, they're my client, but they're, the city attorney is really there at the meeting, and they'll do a, a closed session kind of entry protocol that um, is not in compliance with the Open Meetings Act. That's not Robert's rules. That is law. That is where if you do it wrong, you could call into question uh, the propriety of your closed session, which is like, that's, that's not good news, right? That is the kind of thing that, you know, exposes villages and DDAs to unfriendly, unhappy litigation. So moving into closed session with clear statements of why you're moving into closed session, then one little other piece of advice, when you're in closed session, and I know we're drifting off a little bit, but I always give, have to give this advice to uh, clients. When you're in closed session, that is not your, your, your triggering mechanism for closed session is not licensed to talk about anything you want. It, I've many times, almost like it's almost common and it, it really uh, bothers me. I will, where I will be like the general counsel to an entity and clo go into closed session with the, with the client and they'll, the prototypical example is the grounds for closed session is to discuss um, a, an opinion of counsel, right? I'll write him a, a, an opinion on something, legal question. And that is grounds for closed session because it's privileged information. There actually isn't a specific uh, 
advice of counsel uh, ex uh, closed session uh, mechanism. It's really just anything that's privileged or otherwise uh, not subject to disclosure by statute. And so they'll start talking for 30 seconds about the opinion, and then they'll talk about all the strategic implications of the opinion and what they're going to do with it, the very kind of discussion that needs to take place in the open session. So I know that's not the subject of our meeting here, and I, I don't want to lecture you or anything like that, but I'm just, since we're here talking about these issues, it is a hazard that I see all too often, and it can be a problem when you've gone too far, uh, sort of launching from a, a, a finite and narrow closed session trigger mechanism to a, a broader wide range of discussion. But I will not take any more of your time on that, and I know you've asked questions, but um, I know I'm, I'm sure we're, we're over. I haven't been watching the, the okay. clock, but uh, any more questions we can discuss. The, in the, when you're in the closed session, mm -hmm. are you, you're not supposed to make motions, correct? Uh, really? You come out of closed session. Yeah, yeah, that's, and that's then right. Make motion. And it could motion be, we direct the manager to do this, we discuss in the closed session. Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, those can be very challenging. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the solutions to that is usually you have a um, kind of like a, a, an, in, an individual who's sort of representing the board, let's say, and so, very often, let's say it's litigation, right? You've got a litigation strategy. That's the kind of thing you are, you are supposed to talk about in a closed session. You've got, you'll have the, the, the adverse party sitting there taking notes. And, um, but you really don't go through the motion second to like, if you're trying to map out a litigation strategy, hopefully you do it with the lawyer in the closed session with you, or maybe you've got staff that is interfacing with the lawyer and you do have to have a more, um, uh, I'll call it informal or less structured discussion that kind of leads to a, uh, a path or a strategy and then whatever individual, whether it's your lawyer or your staff that's interfacing with the lawyer, um, you know, hopefully has a clear um, strategy going forward. And then that'll often boil down to like some specific, uh, you know, settlement offer or something that's much more tangible and you can discuss that in closed session and then, you know, maybe approve the item in open session even though the item itself was, um, like the contents of it may be confidential. Very good. Any other questions? Oh, very good. All, All right. right. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, now we have a call to the public. It looks like we don't have anyone. Uh, so the next item is the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are approved by one vote. Uh, financial reports on page 17, director's report on page 26, committee meeting minutes and work plan and event updates, page 41, and marketing report, page 49. Ken? Move to approve consent agenda as presented. Support. Roll call, please. Russo? Support. Yes. Shell? Yes. Sheridan? Yes. Laurent? Yes. Barnett? Yes. Cole? Yes. Van Portfleet? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. I mean 7 0. Uh, next is approval of agenda. By order of the chair, no matters will be discussed after 10 30 p.m. unless the DDA board votes to continue the meeting. Uh, next is financial matters, bill approval, page 54. Need a motion. Need a motion. Oh, sorry. Do we have a motion to approve the, Ken? So moved. Second. Roll call. Oh, do you roll, have a roll call? Roll call, please. Cole? Yes. Shell? Yes. Sheridan? Yes. Barnett? Yes. Caruso? Yes. Laurent? Yes. Van Portfleet? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Okay, now uh, financial matters and bill approval on page 54.
I make a motion to approve disbursements in the amount of twenty six thousand four hundred and fifty eight thousand eighty cents for December twenty twenty one. Support. Uh, roll call, please. Uh, oh, sure. Yep. Uh, what are the, uh, we don't have a media tracker, so what are the Yes, Matt Shell, as vice chair, looked at the, um, at the bills on Friday. I have here the signed document that both the treasurers looked. Um, that was all contract, lots of contract work there. Um, for um, for the, um, the entertainers, for um, all of the events that we just had, for the horse and carriage ride, for the um, lights. I mean, we just, we were doing a lot of contracts at that time. I agree, that's what I saw in the bills. I agree, that's what I saw in the bills. Oh, yeah. Those contract review. Yeah. This, this mic does, I, I, I keep trying to keep this fall down. I'm just going to do this. Good job. <laughs> there any other discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Shell? Yes. Sheridan? Yes. Lorand? Yes. Van Portfleet? Yes. Barnett? Yes. Cole? Yes. Caruso? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Uh, new and old business. Uh, first is the annual election of DDA board officers on page 58. Um, there is a slate of um, board members who have expressed interest uh, in being the board officers. They are Debbie Burgess as the chair, Sam Caruso as vice chair. Secretary uh, Hank Laurent and Treasurer Matthew Shaw. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to uh, elect the slate of officers as presented and thank them for being willing to volunteer. Further <laughs> Thank you. Do we have a second? Support. Thank you. Any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Sheridan? Yes. Laurent? Yes. Caruso? Yes. Cole? Yes. Shell? Yes. Barnett? Yes. Van Portfleet? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, next is the attorney options for DDA board consideration on page 61. Um, this is uh, for consideration of the backup um, legal firm um, if our contracted legal firm is unable to perform a service for any reason. Um, on October 25th, the bids were opened and reviewed by Chris Barnett, Joseph Young, and myself, and there were two lawyers who submitted bids for review. They were Sarah Gabus from Foster Swiss and Robert Davis from DBS Attorneys. Interviews were scheduled, and Lloyd Coe, Joan Sheridan, and Matt Schell were on the interview team. Um, the team found that both of the lawyers were very competent. They had um, DDA experience, um, and they both had uh, advantages. Um, the interview team and myself both recommend that we um, go with the low bid, which is um, Mr. Davis from DBS Attorneys. Um, as backup legal counsel. Um, and then uh, we could also consider um, going to bid for permanent legal counsel. Um, at this time, we are spending um, $165 per hour for our legal counsel, and our backup legal counsel is going to be $95 per hour. Uh, do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to hire Bar Davis, attorneys as backup for legal counsel, and to request bids for regular legal counsel. Support. Uh, any discussion? I just want to comment that when we started this process, I thought that our existing counsel was at a rate that we would never be able to beat, and uh, 
Mr. Davis was highly impressive in the meeting we had with him, and the rate is uh, just astonishing for the background that he has. So uh, that was good news. So if we do consider going for a primary council bid, I think he should be considered. Any other discussion? Just a quick one. Uh, sure. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm not trying to rehash anything that's happened over the last year, but um, I think it's been misconstrued that some of the action that I sort of an anti VA is the exact opposite of that. that I think I, anytime I was raising concern, it was to protect the interests of the DDA. And hopefully, for the most, most, most part, the DDA and the village's uh, motives are aligned, but occasionally they're not. Um, and so I do, as I've stated in the past, um, support everything this great body is doing to help make our downtown uh, amazing and improve it, like we've like, uh, like we've been seeing. Um, but I do th I do have concerns, so I'm open to the idea of looking at just different legal counsel because um, I think it would be hard to argue that we were getting good, sound, clean advice when sometimes the we were on opposing sides, and I think it's really challenging to have the person advising both sides when they're not necessarily in agreement. So I think this is a sound practice and a concept for us to at least consider, and I would really uh, support that. Um, I'm not looking to start battles, <laughs> but occasionally, again, if our interests aren't totally aligned, we need to make sure we're getting a clean opinion. We can't be both getting advice from the same person. So thank you. How would, those cares, how would this be different? I guess confusing then. So we're still hiring counsel to help us. So how would this be different having a new, a new counsel person? How would that make a well, difference? What the motion was was to hire them as backup counsel, but then go off a bid for regular legal counsel. So if, if he's our regular legal counsel. We would just have him as our attorney. Then who would be our backup? Well, we wouldn't need one. We wouldn't need we would, The reason we need a backup is because, as we saw this year, we were, issues were being raised. Right. that we might be at odds with. We were getting some bills from the village for, for legal things that they were doing. You know, so we wouldn't need backup if we didn't have the same attorney. What the, the reason we need backup is if we have an issue in the future like we had this year, a couple issues this year where we right. were getting advice from the same people. Like, again, think about it in your own personal perception. If you had an issue with your neighbor and you're both using the same attorney, you would never do that, right? So um, you wouldn't need a backup if you had a fully separate attorney in law firm that was representing you because the goal isn't again to fight ever, but right. if you ever need to, you right. make sure you're getting advice. I'm just confused. I thought that we're, that we're looking, obviously this would be our backup person, right, this yep. new attorney, right? But then right. we go ahead and hire him as our full legal counsel. So if there's, a, if there's an argument, it's gonna be the same problem all over again? Too. We're gonna have the same guy? Not, not necessarily because the, the issue that started this process was uh, what Mr. Barnett describes. We, you know, we decided that I'm gonna insert my opinion here. Right. Uh, we didn't think we could get a better price than what the village already had I got you. for things like contract review and that kind of thing. So why, you know, why pay more for those non-controversial things? But we should have somebody ready to go uh, in the event that there's a controversial issue. I got you, cool, thank you. In the process, we discovered that maybe we can almost yeah. half the price yeah. and <laughs> still get somebody that's really good, so. It's pretty amazing. And in, in that situation, there's no conflict of having, you know, the village and DDA represented by the same firm. So we wouldn't necessarily need backup. Not to say we couldn't go find a backup as well if we thought we needed to. Right. Any other discussion? I, I guess I have a question. If we wanted to move tonight to move to hire him, do we need to probably go to bid again? Well, our bid was very specifically for backup, backup. counsel, so I do think we should um, go uh, to bid. We should make it clear that we're actually hiring, that now we're looking for a full time. I think that is fair. So if we wanted to do that, we should first vote on this motion and then make a motion to, afterwards to go to bid. You included it in the motion. And I supported it. The motion was to hire um, and request. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so I think he, he would, if it was affirmative, he would become the backup 
but then it would start the RFP process to say, which that again, assuming the incumbent would bid, he probably would bid, and you know, we could at that time decide we want to stick with this current setup or right. Okay. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Sheridan? Yes. Van Portfleet? Yes. Barnett? Yes. Cole? Yes. Shell? Yes. Laurent? Yes. Caruso? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Uh, the next item is the annual year end Main Street evaluation schedule on page 117. All right, this is for um, the National Main Street Accreditation. Um, the uh, Lake Orion has been accredited since 2006. Um, we do have to go through this process annually. And um, the, eight, the 10 items listed on page 117, um, starting with broad-based community sport, um, all those 10 items, we have to be able to say yes, or the, the consultants who are reviewing us need to be able to clearly see that we um, have these 10 items. Um, they review, they do the review process through conducting interviews with local stakeholders. So for the board members, um, you are requested to attend um, an 11 o'clock interview. And then I am adding in there, because it's January, I'm adding in there the priorities workshop at 6 o'clock and then our board meeting. Um, there, for the accreditation interview, there will be a virtual option for those of you who are busy. For those of you who are board chairs for committees or on a committee, there is a further interview um, at 10 o'clock. And again, that is also that's also going to be um, available as a virtual meeting. Um, if you're a property owner, there's going to be another meeting. Um, if you're a business owner, there's a meeting. I know it's a lot of meetings to talk about, um, to come and talk to these people. They each are going to have a different focus. Um, we're having um, Kathy LaPlante come in. Um, she's with um, the National Main Street Center. Um, I think it's really important for everybody to come to the meetings that, and, I, and I'm making them virtual to make it easier for everybody, and I apologize that I'm taking up your day, but uh, we've had a very interesting set of two years, and I think it's good for us to talk about it um, with the Main Street Center and um, talk about um, everything that we've been doing, and, um, and I'm, I'm requesting that you come and play with me on, on January 11th. Thank you. All right, do we have a motion? Yes, move to receive and file. Thank you, Let's support. 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 Thank you, any discussion? Yes. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, these should, you mentioned a number of these are Zoom, and it doesn't really say that here. If, if, if you take this list, um, if it were to say Zoom available, then... Well, I can change the list. Or if you might just tell us right now which ones are not Zoom. Obviously the 8 o'clock, the noon. Uh, the ones that say open session mm -hmm. are going to be um, virtual option available. Perfect. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I am going to be sending invitations, pers personally sending invitations for each of these meetings separately. Um, so you lucky people may get five or six of these. <laughs> well, maybe not five or six, but you may get a few of them and just know it's because each meeting is, is a different focus. And I appreciate your help and I appreciate you talking to all your business neighbors and any of your committee volunteers and making sure they all attend these. It's very important for our accreditation team that they get to talk to a wide range of people. I have uh, several questions. Yes. Um, at 1.30, open session with property owners. Is that business property owners or is that DDA district, like I'm a homeowner, Does, is it business or home? That one is focused on business property owners. Okay, so I think that probably should say that. Okay. Um, and at six o'clock, the priorities workshop, who mm -hmm. attends that? 
That is for um, the business, that's for the DDA board members. We are, and we're a public body, so everybody's invited to, those, to anything that is a, you know, a, a DDA board meeting is always public. Okay, and uh, if this is going to be in the conference room, can it be masks required because that's pretty close quarters? Sure, sure, we could, I could, in light of that statement, we could also move it here. We could also move it here. And, and I do have the, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, disinfectant sprayers, uh, the big green ones that we gave to all of the restaurants. We have those. We could have it in this room and disinfect in between each meeting if that would, um, that probably would make people feel more comfortable. Well, in light of the pub, current public health situation, I think that would be a good thing to do. Okay, so I'm moving, I'm moving the open sessions to this room from the conference room. Okay. Floyd. Molly, I, <clears throat> I told you I wouldn't be here that week. Would I, could I have an opportunity to speak to... Um, Kathy LaPlante. Kathy LaPlante the week before. Um, is there any, any opportunity you'd be able to speak um, via phone call or virtual meeting on that day? Yeah, the, the problem is where I'm going to be at is there's a three hour time difference. So it would be right when I'm in meetings, uh, you know, where I'm going. So. Well, it'll be <laughs> six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not expecting you to want to talk to anybody at 6 o'clock in the morning. What's that? Um, I mean, the three-hour difference is going to be going, making it earlier for you. 9 o'clock here and 6 o'clock there, correct? No. Yeah, no? but the, those, are open, those are open sessions. Right. I mean, um, like what I was looking at was uh, the... Um, Well, this, this thing with Kathy LaPlante, where she does interviews. Right. I can talk to her. Um, maybe, maybe she has a, a written, some kind of written something that she could send you, a, a, a number of questions that she could send you. That would be all right. <clears throat> okay. I'll talk to Kathy about it. Any other discussion? Just one other thing. You were, are going to come back and update us on all of this and what dates we're supposed to be, where, when. Everyone will be receiving um, invitations, invitations okay. for each session okay. uh, that, they are, uh, that I'm inviting them to. Okay. Do we need a roll call on that? No. Okay. We need a voice vote. You can do a roll call or voice vote, but you need a roll. Okay. You need a vote. Uh, let's do a, a voice vote. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, opposition? Okay. Uh, next is the 2022-2023 priorities on page 120. All right, um, for those of you who have filled this out, thank you very much. I have your information. Um, if you have not filled this out um, as DDA board members, please fill this out. You can, you can um, use the link that we've been providing in the um, newsletters, or you can physically fill this thing out. That'd be fine either way. Um, also, please um, encourage your friends and neighbors to fill this out. We are interested in um, the public participation. It matters to you guys when you're making decisions about, um, about how we're going to spend our time and money um, for downtown Lake Orion. Um, so the more input we have, the better idea we will have on, on what our downtown really needs um, from a community pr perspective as well as a DDA board perspective. And then 
My thought was we could have a discussion before the meeting so we could really kind of hash things out and talk about it and I could explain it more and then during the meeting you guys could make a decision or we could talk about it more if you're not ready to make a decision but um, this is um, this is the the priorities that we will make. We will then um, base our budgeting um, for our new fiscal year on what we decide. Do we have a motion? Yes. <laughs> Move to receive the file and. Uh, this is the same one that some of you filled out. You fill it out. I have yours. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have a second. Support. Oh, second. Oh. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, next is the DBA board member survey on page 124. Okay, um, and Joan, if you would like to speak on this a little bit, that is wonderful. Um, this is a DDA board survey that was put together by the organization committee. This is the beginning of our community outreach program. Uh, sure. Um, one of the important things about nonprofits is that we utilize the skills and talents of the people that we serve with and as well as capturing a volunteer hours for when we apply for grants. And we've got some opportunities coming up that we really need that data for. And this is an attempt to find out some of your, um, your ideas, uh, it, the, the answers that you give to the survey may help um, us note clusters of ideas that we can build on. We can use that for marketing purposes. Um, not to say that Joe said this, but that I really like Lake Orion because. So it's a little bit of marketing. It's, it's a little bit of data mining because I don't know that Sam not only fixes bodies, but he also does remodeling and he may be able to contribute to a project that we're doing and we can, we, we, we have talent here that we don't know about because we don't get together and talk at that level. So this is an effort to bring some of that up to help us get to know each other better and help us understand our commitment to the community. Mr. Chair, yeah. <clears throat> I think the motion you might be looking for here is to uh, approve of the survey and to go forward. That sounds and good. That's yeah, that's fine. that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the uh, the volunteerism, the business partner involvement in your role, I think these are really good things, and I really like the idea, and there's going to be some good stuff that will come out of this. So I'd like to make a motion to accept and recommend that we move forward with the survey. Do we have a second? I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, if I could say, please, um, if you would like to fill this out and give it to me today, that's fine. If you want to email it to me, that's fine also. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, the next item is the Planning Commission motion presented by the Village Manager on page 126. All right, so um, the, line, uh, the timeline on this is in October, the Planning Commission requested that the Village Manager present to this um, property um, to the board for consideration. And in November, um, the request from the DDA board was to um, I had it on the consent and I did not have as much information as I've provided today. So um, the request was to put it back um, to the meeting with lots of information so you guys could review. Joe, do you have anything to add about this property? Other than that, the 
preliminary PUB from bulk development to 18 units, the apartment building to the west, and the 89 development units of them on the uh, east have been approved preliminary PUD, or will be, I'm sorry, they're in the process. Um, so that property would be in the middle of those two. And this is 125 Elizabeth Street. or this land purchased by the DDA was uh, unnecessary. And so thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, the next item is the Oxford Strong Activity Support, page 135. letter on your behalf um, to the the Oxford DDA board so I just want to it's in the, it's on page 40 um, of the packet but I just wanted to read it to you um, dear Kelly and the DDA board of directors and this is going to Oxford uh, the village of Lake Orient and its DDA board stand with you. This tragedy continues to be felt throughout our shared community and has touched local DDA businesses directly. Our hearts are with the families, the businesses who employ Oxford High School students, and everyone who has been directly impacted. Please let me know if there's anything we can do to support you and the Oxford community. Sincerely, Molly. Um, and I... I also in my report, um, I, <laughs> I worked so hard on trying to come up with um, a simple statement, um, and this is what I came up with. Small businesses reflect and respond to the sentiments of the community, and they are the foundation from which a downtown builds its character. Um, and our DDA businesses have definitely been responding um, to the tragedy in Oxford. Um, I do not have a complete list here. I want to verify what everyone's doing. And if you guys know um, of something that's um, happening in a downtown business that I don't have listed here, I want to be able to record everything that um, Lake Orion has, um, has done in response and support of, um, of the Oxford community. Um, but you can see um, Oat Soda, Fork and Pint, Wine Social, 313 Pizza, Sagebrush Cantina, Anita's Kitchen, Valentino's, Bitter Tom's Distillery, Michigan Outfitters, M&B Graphics, um, 20 Front Street, A Bean to Go, and Salon U all have um, responded um, in support of the Oxford community, and I thank them very much. 
Um, we have, um, we've been sharing the information that's been provided um, for the Oxford Strong Support um, information. Um, we've been making sure that that's on our website and um, included in our newsletters. Um, we've put a, a banner out on a 24, the yellow one that says Lake Orion Heart Oxford. That's, that's from, from us. Um, we had, a, we had a marketing town hall meeting um, for our businesses just to talk about um, how to market um, in this holiday season, how to do marketing under a crisis during a crisis, excuse me. And then um, the last thing that I forgot to put in here is all of our um, lighted, our dragons, our lighted dragons are blue and gold. I mean, it's a simple, small thing, but um, we did that too. We should have our LOL campaign go out, L-O-L-O, -L -L -O. so Lake Orion loves Oxford. Oh, thank you, good idea. Molly, I, Molly, I know that the Art Center has been in contact with some of the art teachers over there and are putting programs together. Thank you. Um, I just want to just briefly add that um, our businesses, um, this happened and all of us are very, you know, have been affected and we're all sad about what has happened. I mean, very sad. And our businesses, um, the effect that it had on them during this holiday season is that um, nobody, you know, everyone's, many people stopped shopping, many people canceled their holiday parties, many people, you know, just stopped their plans because there was a huge interruption. And then on top of that, these businesses, so that's a loss of income, but then they're also responding to a need and responding with the, the same sentiment of the rest of the community that we want to help. Um, so um, they have further donated and it, you know, it's a further loss of income that they're absolutely willing to do. But I think that um, as a DDA board, um, we need to recognize that sacrifice that they have very, very willingly made and, and a circumstance um, during the, the one of the most important quarters um, financially for a business, a small business. Thank you, Molly. I, um, I'll move the receiving file and the report with a comment. Um, the, uh, the outpouring of support has been remarkable. And uh, just on Friday, we had a business roundtable meeting, and some, some, there were some local uh, DDA businesses there. And just not, it was not a planned fundraiser, but we raised $70,000 in like 10 minutes just people raising their hand and saying they contribute, which is remarkable, meeting a whole bunch of needs. Um, and most of them wanted to do it somewhat anonymously, but that was the sentiment in the room is, you know, a lot of these people are the first ones to step up when they're asked or even when they're not asked. So the best we can do to continue to drive people to um, purchase gift cards and things like that, some of these, these businesses, a lot of the restaurants especially that had family parties and things planned that have been postponed or canceled. Then also we're asked to donate, as you mentioned, so kind of double whammy. So to the extent we can support our DDA um, businesses, um, maybe consider gift cards for, for Christmas and things would be great. But uh, it's been really remarkable to see the community coming together to support Oxford. That was my motion in my walk. Thank you. <laughs> support. Um, if we can do discussion, um, just along with what Chris was saying um, regarding the gift cards, um, we could, um, for the month of January, um, for the, the DDA board could decide to um, double uh, the reimbursements. So when, um, when, a, when a, let's, let's pick Ed's Broadway gift and costume, because he's here. <laughs> so when Ed's, um, brings us a gift a downtown dollar for reimbursement. Those are each downtown dollar is twenty-five dollars. We could make a motion to for the month of January double it. So for every twenty-five dollar downtown dollar that we are reimbursing back to a business, we could reimburse them fifty dollars. It's just a thought. It's just something that we could do in response. Um, 
and we just had a downtown dollar sale, a two for one sale, um, it was $18,000, nine came from consumers, 9,000 from consumers, and 9,000 from um, the people who bought. Um, so we, we do have extra money from the gift certificate sales right now. So I could, Mr. Chair, so I could actually act as a, uh, a fast stimulus to those businesses that get the downtown dollar certificates, they get an additional contribution from the DDA for 30 days. And the people being selected, I'm just thinking this process through, because I like the idea, the, uh, they could shop their most favorite <coughs> Uh, business and, and support it that way. It sounds pretty interesting. What do we have out there as far as downtown dollars that could possibly be redeemed about how many thousand? There's $18,000 worth of um, downtown dollars that were just um, sold and those um, expire April 1. Um, if we were to do this um, stimulus, I would suggest maybe that we start it, you know, next week or in, and end it. So do 30 days, but have it start before Christmas and end. I don't know what the what the day would be, but it would be like from December 20 to January 20, something like that, um, so that the Christmas holiday shopping season could still be captured and. So the full exposure might be as much as 18,000, but. It's more than likely going to be less, probably maybe at a high point 12, maybe 15. I mean, and the DDA board could say we will do this reimbursement until we reach a certain number also. Yeah. yeah. I'd be nervous about just having it on cap and also mm -hmm. where are we going to pull the money from? Well, from gift certificate um, redemption, and if we run out in that GL number, um, we take more money from, I mean, we take it from our gift certificate sales and put it back in. Um, the, the sales from last year, um, those gift certificates are going to expire at the end of the year. Not everybody redeems their certificates. It's, it's just a decision sometimes people decide not to. So. What we have right now, um, we have not, we haven't used all the, all the funds from the sale from last year. So we have, if you guys want to put a number on there, a limit um, that makes sense, um, makes, you know, or maybe a limit for business, I, I don't, I, I just like the idea and I would like to talk about it and make it, and have it make sense. Do you have history on what's been claimed in years past? So you can put a dollar. Let's look at it on the financial reports. Yeah, and probably a per business cap makes sense because you don't want it all to go to one business. I think it's going to be an arbitrary amount that we just need to decide on. Yeah, I, I mean, and yeah. Uh, I'm willing to look at that twelve thousand or ten thousand dollar figure. And uh, it could be very good for the businesses. I believe if we were to try to cap the amount of money that's given to each business, it would be uh, a lot of difficulty to track and uh, it, count it. And yes, um, well, I would definitely say we we have to cap the program. Yeah, we can't. Yes, I mean I, it's not fair, but the downtown businesses know and. Want to flood the market with downtown dollars and then come back two to one? That would be a really smart business decision. So <laughs> we need to have a cap so that we don't all of a sudden get to January and say, "Great news, fifty thousand downtown dollars," and all of a sudden it hits the DDA budget with fifty Gs that we didn't right. plan to budget. So I like the concept personally, but I just think yeah, we need I like a little bit of honing it in a little bit just so we don't. Okay, so um, if you look on page twenty-two. Um, the gift certificate redemption is 248-725-825-000. And we put $15,000 in there, and that reflects, um, that's a higher amount, that's twice what we normally put in there because we were taking into account um, paying off 
uh, re redeeming um, the, all of the gift certificates from the sale last December. Um, and it has not, it does not show in our books yet because um, this ended, uh, this particular financial report ends um, at the end of November and our sale was at the beginning of December. So, but there is $18,000 that we have collected. Um, so we, and, and if you look on gift certificate redemption, we currently have $12,275 available. That could be used for the businesses, or the 12,000, just to make it a nice, easy thing, um, for 30 days, and then if we actually, uh, you know, use every single dime there, then um, the the money that has just been received um, from the sale that we had at the beginning of December, um, that will be in our books, and we could make a budget adjustment to move that money over to gift certificate redemption if it becomes necessary. So, so what doesn't get redeemed from what was just purchased would backfill this if we went over? Yes. So is this a combination for us, maybe? Excuse me? What well, might help us, do you, do you have something in mind you might recommend that we may work kind of what was kind of set to um, maybe that might be helpful? All right. I, I mean, I'm having this discussion with you um, because I would like us to respond um, now, if we can. Um, okay, so. I was that if you do that, you want to give us a couple of dollars or something, I was used about time on this, which is awesome. Like, I would be incredible. I think it's cool, but maybe you do that, yeah. I do. Okay. Um, all right, so my uh, suggested motion would be to double gift certificate redemption um, for uh, 30 days starting December 30th, or excuse me, to starting December 20th okay. and ending um, either January 17th or 30 days from December 20th. That, that's not 30 days. I think it is. Or we could go to the end well, of the month. Well, it, I, simpler to say you have a budget limit of, 50, say, $15,000. Right. That you, so you've got 15 right now. Just so say you make a budget minimum to increase revenue by 15 and redemption by 15 and authorize that they'll double the redemption of certificates until that money is yeah. gone. To the and business. With an end date of June, to January the, 31st. It needs to say, Joe, to the business owner. So people don't think right. for 25 they get 50. Right. And I'd like to support that suggestion that Joe has in the amount of $12,000. Well, through January 31st. Has a cap through the month of January. I see a communication problem. How do you tell everybody in town that somebody hands you $25 and boom, it's $50? Well, okay, that is a communication with the, for the businesses. We will tell the businesses um, that, I mean, and it's gonna happen regardless. You turn in your, your downtown dollars and I'm going to, double. you know, the, the DD office is going to process it as double what it is. So it's, it's, this is directly affecting our business owners. This is something we're giving back to our give business okay. owners. The consumer True. isn't getting double. No, no this isn't about the consumer is getting today. Double. Correct. Got it. Yes, make, okay. Go ahead. We get us, I'd like to make that as a motion. I would just say that these would be redeemed for receipts of customer sales, not a business going out and buying 5,000 right. Right. gift cards and then turning them in for $10. So well, they're sold out already. Right. They're gone. <laughs> they're gone. <laughs> Those are sold out. That was kind of a point. You've got to have some rules. Because if you don't, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a smart true. business decision. Right. I mean, we're basically just creating a grant that you could do that unless we have yeah, some. We need to have receipts. Yeah, for yeah business receipts, right? Yeah. Or sales the document. I just so that it's understood. It's so, all right. So, um, gift certificate redemption for gift certificates. Uh, distributed prior to December 15 
excuse me, December 10. How about December 10? So I have those records. I can tell if something has been, when something has been distributed. So um, gift certificates that were distributed to customers prior to December 10 that are redeemed by businesses through the end of the, through the, end of the month, the January, um, up to $12,000 will be worth uh, twice um, the redemption for the business. You said December 10th? And it, and it has a receipt? If the, re if, the, if the gift certificate, the gift certificate has to have been issued to the consumer prior to December 10. I'm just, you know, I know that uh, we issued a whole month, we, our sale was December 1 and 2, so I'm definitely covering all of them. And you just made it as December 10? Yeah, I just I want to make sure that I I know that I know that the sale ended before then, and that anybody who was buying things for for Christmas presents they um, they paid for their gift certificates before the tenth. So, okay. I mean I'm just I'm just have knowledge of when the sales were happening at the office. That's why I'm saying the tenth. That's fine. That, that's good. That, that solves that solves the issue. Of yeah. I mean, and actually, it could be today. Today's date would be fine, too. I'll you know, use that language meeting. to adjust my motion. Perfect. Let's get a cap with 12,000. 12,000, yeah. yeah. I like that. I think it's very fair. All right, it's important. And with, with the language that it's, I mean, you can't go by the language that it's for everything, anything purchased before today's date. Right. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Can I take your motion? I, that would be, she had that in there. I'm just sure yeah. 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 She, she mentioned that. Yeah. I, I just support it. Can I buy some? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Well, this should be a roll call. Roll call. Let's yeah. See. Cole. Yes. Lorraine. Yes. Shell. Yes. Sheridan. Yes. Barnett. Yes. Caruso? Yes. Van Portfleet? Yes. Motion v carries 7 0. Very creative, Molly. Thank you. It's good, yeah. It's received some good input, good ideas. Okay, next is uh, reports, resolutions, and recommendations. Uh, first is Executive Director. Hi, I feel like I've been uh, giving you a report of what I want you to hear <laughs> for the entire meeting. So um, I want to thank you very much for um, being creative with, with, with me right now um, for support of our businesses. Um, I am very happy that we can do something in support of them. Um, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, village manager. Um, I just wanted to, you know, last night the um, Village Council received the annual audit presentation. Uh, included in that, of course, is the DDA funds. Uh, and we certainly can make a presentation, but I did want to, you know, that the audit report was an unqualified opinion, best opinion you can get. There were no adjusting journal entries, so the financial statements, which you have been seeing all along, are accurate and complete. And the um, DDA is shown as a separate component unit on page 10 and uh, also back later on pages 76 or 67 in the back because it's separate funding. But the fund balance uh, as shown was. Um, you guys don't have that copy, no, do, I, do they? No, yeah. I'm just we'll, we'll get that next yeah. month. He's just yeah. going through the report for you. Okay. So, so I just wanted to verbally report that the, you know you have. Um, a net position of $3.4 million, of which 2.7 of that's in capital assets, and it's net of the $500,000 loan for the parking lot, but your unrestricted funds are 774, which 214 of that is in the property acquisition fund, and the other funds are shown on the financial statements are reserved for operating and parking project, and the fund balance uh, at this moment, unrestricted is the 46,954 is shown in your statement. So I just wanted to be a real quick cap update and then we can provide more information. Uh, future meeting, just up getting update from last night. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Uh, next is call to the public. 
looks like we don't have anyone here. So board comments and training feedback. Uh, start with Ms. Sheridan. Um, I'd just like to remind you to please fill out the survey. It will help us get some direction. And um, of course our prayers go out to Oxford continually. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burnett. A couple of things, a few things tonight. Um, first of all, uh, the township um, offices did move. We moved on November 29th. Um, we're at, we were at 25, 25 jobs, and now we are at 23, 23. Um, still getting settled in, but if you want to come visit, we'd love to have you. And we'll be doing something in January, um, probably like an open house for the community. Um, I did, after the last meeting, um, reach out to some people to see if we could um, raise some funds for uh, so we didn't have to spend all the DDA funds that we did budget for for the park improvements. I do support the park improvements. Um, uh, I have at least one business that's interested and willing to participate and it's like a, um, we want to structure like a public-private partnership so obviously the public is the DDA money, the private would be the private businesses. Um, this happens all over the country. And I still would love to have some time, I know it's been super crazy, but just to chat with you or Molly or whatever the committee is that brainstorm how we can leverage that so that we can keep as much money in the DDA checkbook to help do parking projects and obviously, well, whatever we decide is a priority um, collectively. So um, that's great news. Um, I'm not, I can't, I'm not gonna give you all specifics today, um, because I, I'm working to make it better than the initial um, um, offer, <laughs> and I think that we might be able to do that. So that's that's good news. Um, and then um, the parade is this. I'm sure someone else will talk about this. The parade is this. The Hollyjock Valley is Friday at Galling. Sounds like there are tickets available because of the new date. Um, I talked to John Cooper and Bill Pacino almost daily on that event. And then the parade is Saturday. And um, I know lots of folks volunteer, but um, somehow part of being the township supervisor, you're in charge of stacking the floats. So this will be, I think, my 10th year doing that. And I've lost a couple of volunteers. So if anyone's interested in wanting to help, it's at 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock when the parade starts. Um, just organizing the chaos on the back. And I know um, co organizing the chaos on the front end. <laughs> <laughs> If anyone's interested, give me a message. Um, but uh, usually it's John Stein, who's a long time for Steve, and Mike Flood, and myself. Um, so we just need a few of us. Um, so far, I think it's me and maybe Julie Darrell from my most. If anyone's interested, I'm going to a couple of hours at 4 ish until the parade roll at 6. And then you can go watch the parade. Anyway. So that's it for me. Thank you. How should someone get a hold of you? Call me, text me, email me. I think all of you have my cell phone number. I'm not going to say it on live on TV here, but um, <laughs> right because I, I might my have emails are good. My email cbarnett at orientownship.org. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, so thank you. I would like to volunteer. I'm just going to say that right now publicly. Okay. Good. Good. Um, in addition, um, thank you, Chris, for talking about this. Um, we're going to have a um, we're have festival warming hubs um, at the DDA office, um, and because of the date change, I now only have one brand new employee who's going to be um, setting up the fires and and a cocoa bar and and things like that. We're going to have some things because we're right on the route. Um, I uh, volunteer to um, do the parade registration. That's my job. So I'm there from three until six. So if there's anyone who can help, thank oh, you, okay. Sam, thank you. Yeah, set up fires and such. Is that the same um, time, four to six or a different time? It's four to six, okay. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I know I have a couple of people, I think, setting the volcanoes, but just wanted to have anybody that's not volunteering here and something small. Okay, cool. Yeah. So thank you, sure. I'll help you out there then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Brad, um, Brad, our brand new admin coordinator, he's doing a great job. And um, and it's, you know, it's not Susie's fault that she's going to be out of town on the 18th, but she's going to be out of town, and I, I would feel more comfortable having our brand new employee with someone else. So thank you. I appreciate that. 
Okay, Sorry. well, I, I received the uh, binder a week ago, and believe it or not, I have read all of it. Oh. I didn't memorize all of it, but I might know enough to be dangerous going forward. <laughs> so that, that was kind of fun and had a lot of questions, and we'll keep looking at it. Um, and the other thing is I'd like to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Uh, Dr. Caruso? Yeah, so I'm looking forward to the event this weekend, volunteering, and wish I could help you out, but I guess I, I should ask me a long time to help her out first. That's why I was asking. Perfect. But, but I'm looking forward to a fun event, and, and you know, and, and despite all the things that went on in Oxford, we you know my, our prayers in, 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 are with, with that community, and you know, I've had some, some patients come in and whatnot, and I've given them free care and things like that just to help them out, just coaches and whatnot, people there. But they're really hurting. They're, they, they need our help and support, you know, in, in, more, in many ways than they need to. So what's the best way to financially support that ditch? Is there, is there a certain place to donate, donate money to? What's the best place to go to? I don't know where to go so to. So I can tell if it's okay. Please. Yeah. Um, so we had, a meeting, we had a community collaboration meeting last week, um, and then, the, then Jack came to this breakfast I talked about Friday. The best place that people want to write a check is to Oxford Bank. Oxford right. Bank. Um, the to Oxford Bank? Bank? The yeah, other, they, they have funds that you can go to the website, right on the homepage, okay. there's a link. 100% plus Perfect. goes to the okay. board they're electing, which will probably be like a township board member up there, the CEO of the bank, um, a couple staff members in the school, to make sure that they are vetting all the needs. Perfect. So that's the best place. So, yeah. Genesis Credit Union also has a, a benevolent fund set up, and both of those 100%, and then I think in Oxford Bank's case, I think they're matching some of those funds, so it might be 100 plus percent. Perfect. Go to the victims. The GoFundMe is taking 8%. So go to the website and there's a, there's a link to go. Right on the Oxford Bank homepage. Perfect. Yeah. That's excellent. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's something, I mean, they need a lot of help. And, and our, we're, we're such a, we're, so, we're, we're blessed to be that we, we are together. It's pretty neat to see all the support. I mean, it's been, it's been incredible since support from my pace and staff and, and all, of, all of our businesses. It's pretty incredibly cool. So, um, again, my hearts are, my, all my thoughts and prayers are for, for, the, for all the healing of the teachers. I've got patients or teachers and students that went through the process and seen them. And, it's just it's just unique seeing people go through that situation and come in and you know crying your shoulders. It's, it's nice, but I'm just we're blessed to have a great community and the DDA board helping helping out these these causes for businesses downtown because they got hit hard. Because I know even my, I mean at my office I don't care we, we were you know one couple of days slow but who cares? But it, it was bottom line is that a lot of the business downtown restaurants they lost a lot of income because of of the situation that happened, but. It is what it is, but it is, and despite that, they're, they're, they're giving back to the community, which is cool. It's a lot to say about our small, loving community, so it's cool. But Merry Christmas, everybody, and uh, we'll see you guys at this Saturday, and Happy New Year. I want oh. to bring up the Christmas parade as well. Um, I think it's going to be larger than expected. Uh, there's going to be a lot of floats in it, a lot of characters. We have a lot of people that are excited, um, you know, to be in the parade. So we think it's we think it's going to be better than expected, is what it amounts to. So hope everybody shows up. Um, I have a couple of suggestions to Shop Small Saturday that I wanted to bring up. I think the our hours should have maybe been instead of I think they were like 10 to 2 or something like that. It may have been better to go like 11 to 5 or 11 to 6 or 12 to 5 or 12 to 6 and try to pick up those people that are coming downtown, you know, for lunch and dinner as well, you know. And, and I also think that it would have been, I brought this up before and I know that it, it's hard to get the volunteers, but maybe it's we could go to the high school next year to get more volunteers and have... Uh, more of a presence on each of the corners just to make it look like there's more of something going on you know what I mean it because we had the table set up over in front of um, Hanson's which is great for people that are coming down um, you know uh, uh, Flint going east on Flint Street but for people driving west on Flint Street then they would have been you know they would have been past it by the time uh, they wouldn't have been able to see the, the tables is what it amounts to. So anyways, those are just suggestions I think that maybe we can improve on next year. I, I, think, I think we just need to make it more visibly 
promote it, you know? You want it more of an event. You want Shop yeah. Small Saturday to look and feel like yeah, an event. I, yeah, we need more signs, more banners, more people, you know. Okay. Just my thoughts on that. Um, and of course our prayers go out to Oxford too. I, it's not a whole lot more I can mm. say that hasn't been said, so. But we see the people come in our store all the time and, you know, it's just tragic. Mr. Van Portfleet? Is there an opportunity or time to get an additional blast out? I'm, I, I hope, much like Mr. Cole had said, that we have a lot of people, but anything we can do to assist that, encourage that, any additional opportunities for marketing blast, uh, get out there one more time with social media, um, make sure that people get down here for the parade. It's good. For the parade? It's, uh, there's, um, a moment of uh, respect that's going to be provided for the injured and, and, and the uh, deceased and, and, and the um, unfortunate event and things like that. So um, it's just to get down here and support. It's going to be a great time. Um, I agree, prayers, Oxford, Orient Strong, and we're all in there together. Uh, Happy holidays to all, and thank you for everything that everyone's done this year. That's it. All right. Uh, I just want to thank everyone uh, who has come to service and prayer for Oxford, uh, recognize the efforts of our businesses like we already have, of uh, Matt Pfeiffer and everyone else who's stepped up to help. Um, and uh, just, you know, ask everyone to keep Oxford strong and uh, the Maddie Matters movement in mind, uh, not let those fade off quickly. And just uh, remember this and uh, hopefully we can somehow not have this happen again. Mm -hmm. So that's all. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right.